A few brief announcements as we get started. Uh, remember that we do have some more talks this spring in our virtual positioning theory series. So please register for, um, for those. Uh, I believe that Bo is going to put the, the link in the chat for us for those and perhaps the poster as well. But registration is required. We have a few of those set. And then we're also in the pre-planning stages for adding some more talks for, uh, for the fall uh, series. And those will also be based on our upcoming handbook on positioning theory. And speaking of the handbook, um, the Rutledge International Handbook of Positioning Theory is now fully in press. Authors have just received their proofs or will be very soon. Uh, so this will be forthcoming um, sometime in the next few uh, next few months. So be, be on the lookout um, for that. There is a website that details um, the the chapters that are part of the handbook. They're basically four parts of the handbook, uh, conceptual foundations and explorations, methods and analytic frameworks, and then applications across various disciplinary topics and a final concluding section on just some future directions and um, reflections. Also a reminder that um, the Positioning Theory 2024 conference is coming up in July, July 28th to August 1st. And this will um, start with an evening reception, three days of conference sessions and keynotes. And then we have an extra day for people who are interested in sharing data and data analysis participation. So you should have received, if you submitted for this, you should have received uh, uh, a, a response already on your um, on your program proposal submission. If you did not, um, please reach out to us. Make sure that um, we we have you on our radar. But we are moving ahead with the conference. We would really look forward to seeing any of you who are there. Um, I don't know if Posse Hervonen is here this morning with us. I think he could not be. Now, Bo or Cindy, have you seen Posse on our list? I don't think he is here. Uh, one thing I know that Posse mentioned for anyone who's planning to attend the the conference is that uh, that the Cupio Airport, where uh, where the conference is being held at the University of Eastern Finland, they decided to do work on their airport right during the time of the conference. So there is a train and other means to get there, but just be aware of that. And I think that information is up on the conference website uh, at, that is being hosted through the University of Finland. And the registration should be open very soon. I talked to Posse about that recently. They were um, they are close to getting that done. Okay, and now why you are all really here today, we are going to be hearing uh, from uh, Cynthia Gordon on a talk related to positioning and Goffman and also from Vanessa Denon um, on a talk related to positioning theory and online environments. And what we'll do is we'll just proceed through talk number number one and then go on to talk number two. At the end of this, we'll take questions. And so I'm going to um, I'm going to turn things over to Cynthia um, to get to get started. One thing I did forget to ask our presenters this morning, Cynthia, do you want me to give you any indication of where you are for time? Um, I think I can set a timer here and, okay. and watch it, but thank you. Okay, yeah. great. So I'm going to turn things over to you so you can share your screen. Okay. Does it look okay? Can you hear me okay? Yep, okay. that looks good. Great. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, thanks to the editors for inviting me to contribute to the volume and also for their feedback. I think it's always nice to be invited because you feel like, hey, I'm an expert. And then you write something and you learn so much that you wonder if you were an expert before. So anyway, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm a discourse analyst whose work has uh, drawn extensively on Goffman's framing theory. And I've also long had interests in the relationship between framing and positioning, especially as it's developed, um, as, these, as these have developed in discourse analysis. Um, being at, I, I did my graduate work at Georgetown, 
Um, and at that time, um, Ram Hare was a distinguished research professor there. So actually, um, I'd heard him and him talk about positioning and Deborah Tannen talk about framing. And so I'm very excited about this topic generally. Sorry, let me advance the slide here. Yeah, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is just give an overview um, of the relationship between positioning and framing, especially as these are outlined in the early foundational texts. So Davies and Hare's 1990 paper, as well as their 1999 paper, and then um, framing and the related concept of footing, um, as sociologist Irving Goffman writes about them. Um, oh, sorry. There it is. Um, I'll be talking about some commonalities, um, including the key examples in the foundational publications, which I've always found fascinating, as well as some differences. Um, I will be discussing scholarly understandings of the relationships between the key terms, positioning, position, storyline, and frame and footing, which is not um, set in stone. Um, and I will provide an example of what I think is a productive integration of these theories in discourse analysis research um, before concluding. Okay, so I wanted to just start off with kind of a um, comparison. Um, the foundational publications that I that I am mostly talking about here are the Davies and Hurry 1990 and 1999, um, and then the Goffman um, 1974, the giant book on um, frame analysis, and then also his 1981 essay on footing. And footing and framing came to be sort of wedded concepts in his work. Um, both of these emerged during a time when paradigm shifts were happening in the re relevant academic fields. So um, in psychology, there was a shift um, to the analysis of actual episodes of social interaction as unfolding sequential structures of meaning. Um, so this was part of that shift. Um, and in sociology, um, there was an emphasis on an approach to studying social life that was based on analysis of actual instances of live interactions. And that's when conversation analysis was developing. Um, also, in linguistics, um, there was a move um, during you know, the, the 70s and so on to look at um, what Schifrin describes as language above the sentence, so looking beyond like phonology and morphology, syntax, and so on, to look at language in use. And so these things all kind of line up. I mean, it makes sense that these theories, um, which are ready to, um, ready to um, look at language um, as being used in interaction as an unfolding sequential phenomenon um, emerged as being um, really important. Um, each of these, um, so in the Davies and Hare um, papers, both the 1990 and 1999, there's a, they give a key example. And I'm sure to many of you, um, this is a very familiar example, but it's the example of the colleagues, um, Sano, <clears throat> excuse me, and Enfermata, away at a conference in an unfamiliar city, and this is a recollection um, of this interaction where um, our Informata is not feeling well and Sano is um, um, helping Informata find a pharmacy to get some medicine, and he says, I'm sorry to have dragged you all this way, um, thinking that he is acting as a healthy person, um, aiding the sick, so taking up the position of something like a nurse to a patient, um, and Informata rejects this positioning, she sees it through um, what Davies and Hare call a storyline that's possibly sexist, where her autonomy as a woman is being um, put into question and sort of denied. So there's these competing um, positionings and storylines that lead each participant to reject the other's um, position. And I should say too, this um, interaction is also readily readable um, through um, Deborah Tannen's work on power and solidarity, where um, it's perfectly, um, can be perfectly helpful to say to someone, I'm sorry to have brought you all this way, you know, showing sympathy for someone who is sick. Um, and that can be read as a move for power or solidarity or both at once. So that's a key example there. And this is again, a, a remembered interaction. Um, Goffman's example, and this is one that he goes in, in depth with in uh, begins the essay footing with, um, and this is a newspaper article. So it's again, not an actual recorded encounter, but it's a newspaper article that describes a um, bill signing ceremony involving um, U.S. President um, Richard Nixon and an interaction that he has afterward with journalist Helen Thomas. Um, so what's interesting here for Goffman is how the participants collaboratively establish a shared frame or a sense of what is going on. Um, the interaction shifts from the formal bill signing to some sort of friendly chat and banter afterwards. And what happens is Richard Nixon addresses Helen Thomas directly about her outfit, commenting that she's wearing pants and asking her to spin around so he can assess her outfit. Um, 
and this is uh, to great amusement of the camera men present, and I do say men intentionally, Tylen Thomas was the only woman in the room, um, and she graces, graciously pirouettes at, at his request. Um, but this, what, ha what was a formal bill signing ceremony has become a social kind of sociable talk. Um, the footing has shifted and Helen Thomas becomes a sort of object to be looked at and assessed, which is not unfamiliar um, for many women, um, especially in the 1970s and even in um, professional context. So this is another interaction where it could be read as Richard Nixon showing himself to be a really affable, friendly guy, um, or it, it could be um, read as um, like a micro, what would I would say now would be like a micro microaggression um, as well. So we do have another case where this inter interaction can be interpreted in multiple ways and for framing and footing help us get at that. The way positioning helps us understand the Seno and Informata example. So I did want to talk about some commonalities. Um, there are some commonalities between these theories. These have been pointed out by many people. Um, Tannen observes um, that both explain how people construct meanings and identities in interaction. They do cover similar but not identical conceptual ground, and this has been um, observed by many. So, for example, um, uh, Haray and colleagues write that Goffman's frame is used to refer to storyline genera, for example, the medical frame, which can be realized in a wide variety of storylines. So there's some sort of relationship between the concept of storyline and frame. Um, Sherry Kendall observes that Davies and Haray's storyline um, shares the defining characteristic of the frame as an individual's cognitive understanding of what is taking place, which provides essential context of interpretation for social um, acts. So both of these theories help under us understand how people make sense of interactions and, and um, also construct identities for themselves and others. Um, Alexandra Georgia Kapulu observes that both positioning and framing, along with some other concepts like stance, can be thought of as what she calls meta me meso level analytic concepts that facilitate linkages between micro conversational activities, you know, word choice, speech acts, um, paralinguistic features, all that stuff, um, and larger projects of identity construction. So we're able to link these micro features of unfolding interaction with larger social expectations, understandings, um, and then broader phenomena. And then both can also be understood as intertwined with theorizing on intertextuality. And this is something that's especially interested me in my work. But as Davies and Hooray talk about, um, in order to identify storylines and positions, participants in an interaction kind of scan their memories and their knowledge um, to make sense of what's happening. And we see something similar um, in frame analysis, um, for example, where people draw on what Tannen and Wallet call knowledge schemas um, to make sense of, um, of to make sense of frames and also people and objects in the world. Um, both are also well situated, I would say, to explore conversational misunderstandings, which we saw um, in the Sano and Informata example, as well as issues of social um, social justice. So it, it so happens that these first two examples that the studies lay out um, have to do with a, the common experience. It could be read as the common experience of um, sexism, and various scholars have taken um, this in various directions to use these theories to look at. Um, conversational misunderstandings, such as cross-cultural misunderstandings, and also um, other issues of um, social justice. Right, and then in their initial presentations, um, both theories had room to grow, I guess is often the case for the presentation of a theory in its initial form, especially in terms of integrating more diverse voices and more disruptive perspectives. And this is something that um, Wilt Wilkinson and Kitzinger, Kendall, and um, and uh, Davies has more recently um, argued. So we've seen growth in both of the theories in those directions. Um, <clears throat> some of the observed differences in positioning and framing uh, are, include that positioning can be looked at as a loose set of rights and duties that limit the possibilities and action. Um, and this is absent from framing. It's not a focus of framing, this rights and duties aspect. Um, footing has been observed to capture subtle interactional work elusive micro-level shifts, as Ribeiro explains, whereas positioning captures salient performed social identities. So this perspective has been used a lot in discourse analysis where positioning is kind of like a bigger concept than footing, for example, with um, framing and storyline being roughly equivalent. Um, footing can be reserved to specifically refer to what Goffman calls production format and participation framework. And this is where he deconstructs the speaker into different um, elements, including the author, the animator, and the principal, and also acknowledges that the audience is, or hearer is not a unitary um, entity. 
um, and, and participation. So, so um, and positioning in contrast orients more to identity um, construction. That's one way of understanding these differences in these theories. Um, they also connect to other theories and areas of research differently. So positioning has been noted to readily relate to Sachs's idea of membership categorization and the entailed um, category bound activities in conversation analysis and to work by Oaks on indexing identities um, and framing readily con uh, connect connects to Gumper's concept of speech activities as is used in interactional sociolinguistics as Tannen observes. Um, again, positioning has been claimed to orient more toward identity construction, kind of the autobiographical aspects of interaction, whereas um, framing orients more toward how people establish situational definitions, the understanding of what's taking place at a given moment. Um, in discourse analysis, I would say positioning has become more central in discourse analytic studies of narrative discourse, and this is by way of Bamberg, largely who we heard speak um, last month. Um, and framing in discourse analysis has become more central in the study of conversational interaction. And I could say these are generalizations. This is not the case all the time. My colleague Anna Defina, for example, at Georgetown, um, has used positioning to look at all kinds of different uh, all kinds of discourse. And then various authors have suggested that one approach, and sometimes quibbled about which approach might be more flexible or adaptable to the other. But in the literature, I'd say there's evidence that both of these frames, uh, both of these theories are very um, adaptable and show the flexibility of social interaction and social identities. Um, positioning and framing have been widely used in research on discourse analysis, and some studies have productively integrated these notions. And I think that the key example for this for me is the work of Sherry Kendall. Um, so what I'll talk about briefly is uh, her 2008 piece, The Balancing Act, Framing Gendered um, Parental Identities at Dinner Time. So this is a micro level discourse analysis where she examines four recorded dinner time interactions of members of one family, mom, dad, and their 10 year old daughter, um, Beth. And she identifies numerous frames in the data the positions those frames make available to family members, and how often the parents take up those positions. And she provides a qualitative analysis of examples too. And what she's able to do in doing this is kind of what Georgia Kapulu talks about in terms of um, positioning and framing being these meso-level analytic concepts. She's able to connect micro-level interactional practices to larger social um, inequalities, specifically regarding gender and the distribution of parenting work at home. And this was part of um, her interest in um, balancing the demands of work and family and the work that mothers and fathers do um, at um, at work, at paid employment, and also um, at home. And this is, I should point out that this unequal distribution is not a problem that's gone away, even though she collected her data, you know, quite some time ago. Um, during the pandemic, there was a renewed interest in the unequal distribution of at-home labor that happened, where women took on more responsibilities at home um, during, the, during the pandemic. So this is a, a pattern that um, I could say you could still see in contemporary discourse. So what she ends up <clears throat> identifying is these different frames or definitions of the social situation. What's going on in this conversational moment in the data, um, in this fa these family interactions? Um, she calls the frames dinner, for example. These are some of them. Dinner, um, caregiving, socialization, managerial, and conversational. Um, and within each of these frames, she identifies positions that are made available to the participants, um, particularly the parents, and she's interested in, in how they take these up. So each of these positions um, involves doing different kinds of activities, different um, speech acts. But for example, in the frame of what's going on is like managing the dinner. The, this is, you know, the parents, one of them can assume, they can assume the position of the head chef or the host or the director of cleanup. Um, in the caregiving frame, which is oriented toward taking care of the, the child, um, the parents serve as assistant um, teacher. They take up the positioning of caretaker um, for socialization. And this is, you know, parent-child socialization. The parents um, have the opportunity to serve as various kinds of monitor of the children's different behaviors. In the managerial frame, this is um, managing the child's social calendar, um, you know, horseback riding lessons and all of that kind of stuff. And then there's also this conversational frame, um, which is the sort of sociable, more of the sociable aspect of family um, dinners. Um, so for example, the journalist is someone who keeps all the family members up up to date on each other's events. And this connects to a lot of research by Blum Kolka, Oaks and Taylor and others about how mothers often take the lead in telling your day during family dinner times. Um, moral guardian, facilitator, keeping conversation going and comedian. So these are some of the positions that are made available in these different um, frames. And what 
Kendall finds is that mom takes up the most positions in the most frames. So she did do a counting um, element to this. So for example, in the caregiving frame where what's going on is taking care of the, the child, mom takes up the position of assistant. So she helps the child um, with dinner. She takes up the position of teacher where she teaches the child dinner time um, skills. Um, and also she takes up the position of caretaker where she attends to the daughter's other needs. And this is, they, she takes these positions up at over 90% of the cases where these positions emerge, which leaves 10% for dad. Um, another example in the conversational frame, specifically the more sociable aspect of dinner time, mom takes up positions as journalist. So she requests the daily news from family members in 75% of the cases. Um, the moral guardian, where she assesses the child's past actions, um, you know, doing parent-child socialization in 100% of the cases, and facilitator, where she keeps the conversation going by introducing topics for the family to talk about in 100% of the cases. So in contrast, dad takes up, really most of the time takes up one position, and that is comedian. So while mom is in this interaction, you know, through the position she takes up, um, helping the child, teaching her, caring for her needs, planning her schedule, reminding her to mind her manners. Um, dad's primary position is being sociable um, and keeping everyone entertained and being sort of um, a sort of rebellious um, entertainer. And in fact, mom even takes up the position of behavior mom monitor vis-a-vis -vis, um, dad at times in the data. So this just shows um, a, an unequal um, distribution of labor that's happening at the micro level at a in family dinner table um, conversations. And Kendall identifies these by integrating um, framing by identifying what's taking place at each interactional moment and looking at the positions that these frames make available to participants and how they take them up. Um, I want to show one example. This is um, a, a case um, of the mom and dad interacting um, at the dinner table with um, Beth, their child. And so we have a conversational frame and a socialization frame. So mom starts out um, these are some very tasty tomatoes. So she's interested. She's introducing a new topic to the conversation, facilitating the conversation. Dad, mm-hmm. Uh, child Beth, it's only because deer licked all over them. So talking about deer being in the family garden. Deer licked all over them. And then she says to dad, Mark, you wanna? And then Beth, the child says, yeah, we've got deer poop out. These are, and mom overlaps with her switching to the socialization frame where she's monitoring the child's language, taking up the position of language monitor. Hey, excuse me, let's not use that language. Beth, sorry, mom, it would be deer droppings, thank you. And Beth says deer droppings. So we saw, see the child here being socialized by mom into how to, um, what, what kind of language is appropriate to be, to be used at the table. So this is one of many examples of how, um, of the various positions that mom takes up during the um, family um, interaction and the way they, contrast quite a lot with dads and how this might ex you know, be an additional piece of the element of the unequal um, sharing of burdens at home in, in heterosexual um, couples. Okay, so I'm gonna um, just um, conclude. So, oh, you know, I found writing this very interesting. Um, it's, it's, it's clear, and I, I didn't go into this that much, but both positioning and framing are widely applied in diverse areas of research, and this is covered elsewhere in the, in the handbook. Um, but including discourse analysis, which is my specialization, and it is also applied to a diverse array of contexts. So I showed you a family interaction example, but this has also been applied to workplace meetings. Um, there's a recent study looking at um, using framing and positioning actually together, looking at government um, press briefings of the New Zealand prime minister during COVID. Um, and there's also um, new studies emerging all the time that use framing and or positioning to look at um, communication online and social media contexts, which I think foreshadows our next talk a little bit. Um, there are multiple competing ideas about the exact relationship between positioning and framing with some arguments about which one is more flexible, um, which one um, which one is more applicable to which type of data. But I think we've seen in the research that both of these are really um, productive. Um, both theories demonstrate an aptitude to consider issues of inequality and social justice. And I've just sort of given you a little taste of that. Um, this is evidence even in the original key example for each theory, which happened to be about um, gender and behavior that was potentially um, sexist. And as I mentioned, there's many studies that use one or the other theories to look at issues such as cross-cultural communication and like gatekeeping encounters, um, educational um, uh, difference in access, um, political discourse, and so on. Um, both also provide a means of interpreting current interactions in relation to those prior 
Um, so we framing and positioning don't work if we don't have memories and aren't able to link our experiences to prior experiences. So recent theorizing on intertextuality is also relevant to both theories. And then finally, um, I've presented this example of research by Kendall that provides a compelling example of how positioning theory can be productively brought into dialogue with framing and footing. And I believe this serves as evidence that there is potential for growth in this area that I that I hope to see. So thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, for that presentation and lots of um, ideas I know that I have and questions potential to ask. So as folks are, as we're switching over to our next talk, feel free to put your questions in the chat if you wanna make sure that you um, keep track of those. We'll circle back around to them um, at, the, at the end. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Vanessa Denon. Vanessa, you can go ahead and put your um, slides up and um, go ahead and get started as soon as you're ready. Okay, fabulous. Can you y'all see the slides and hear me okay? Yes, coming through loud and clear. All right, wonderful. Well, I um, you know, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this series. Um, and I was really excited to get an opportunity to be a part of this handbook as well and to contribute on the topic of positioning theory in online environments, which are happen to be the environments where I do much of my research, although as I had the opportunity to delve into the the chapter um, and really explore all the work that's been done on po using positioning theory in online environments, I think sort of like like Cynthia said, it's like the more you go into it, the more you start discovering, and the more the more new learning you're doing yourself. So I'll say I'm I'm very much a learner here myself, uh, exploring this world. So there you go. That's how I will position myself from the very start of this presentation. Um, and for some of you, um, this may be familiar talking about these environments. For some of you, these environments may be very different from the ones that you study. And I will take a little time to get into that as well. For thinking about introducing myself this morning, I thought, well, I, I should get into the mode of what I am talking about here. And you know, how, how do I position myself online in any number of environments? Normally I do the straight academic um, introduction and I have a little bit of a screenshot in the middle there from my official academic profile at Florida State University and you see that it looks very much one way but if you look to the right of it you see the beginnings of a Facebook profile you might get the inkling of oh there's some international travel going on there and of course Facebook asks us if we want to declare what are our institutional affiliations and um, who are we connected to? I see on there I have where I went to school and and who I'm married to. Um, on the, the right, you see Instagram, and it's just a random collection of photos that were chosen to share. But you know, we can look at them together and ask ourselves, you know, what does this mean about a person? Um, I'll admit that I don't think too much about the meaning when I'm sharing things there, but I happen to research teenagers who think an awful lot about what images are going to be lasting in a public space and what that communicates about their identity. A really fascinating thing about that is um, particularly on Instagram, many of them will have two accounts, one that they call their real identity account and the other one that they call their Finsta fake Instagram or their spam account, their extra account. Think about this for a moment. Um, their spam or finsta account is the account where they tend to um, restrict who can see it to their close friends and they share the things they're thinking in the moment the stuff that amused them today all of those little pieces now i think of those as the rich pieces that help me get to learn who somebody is but they don't consider that the real me account so what they call the real me account is the very curated face that they want to put in front of the world but this is how we use these spaces, and that's part of what makes it so fascinating to study them. I wanted to also begin a little bit by telling you how I 
first met positioning theory and started thinking about using it. And this was because I was doing research on online classes and how people engaged in discussion in online classes. And I was doing a lot of content analysis and I was looking for frameworks that were going to help me with that quant with that content analysis. Um, and in particular, looking at the instructor role at that time, and nothing was sitting quite right. And somebody suggested that I pick up the book and read about positioning theory. And I did. And it, it's the first few chapters really started to resonate with um, being able to tease out what was happening with an instructor in an online class? Um, how was the instructor taking that role of authority in the class with the students? How was the instructor sometimes um, communicating as if they were a co-learner? How were the students sometimes accepting everything that came from the instructor? And how were they sometimes pushing back or even holding the instructor accountable for something that they thought the instructor should know or should do? And how do people navigate those situations? So that was my entry point into positioning theory. Um, probably no, it's more than 15 years ago now. And it's something that I keep coming back to time and again in, in my work. Um, but I learned so much doing this chapter, seeing what everybody else was doing in fields different from my own, but, but that were also studying various kinds of online communication. So where I'm going to go this morning with the presentation is I'm going to focus um, on research situated in those online environments. There's stuff on online learning, but also in that larger realm of social media. And by the way, when I use the term social media, I usually go with a very broad definition of it. Um, people usually start thinking, oh, Instagram, Facebook. I want to say Twitter. I should say X. I always think of Prince then, you know, the, the artist formerly known as Prince. I don't want to say the platform formerly known as Twitter, but yeah. Um, but really to any of these online environments where we have the ability to be social with other people. We can be social in a lot of ways. So I'm going to hit on um, three main topics. One is getting into some of the affordances of online spaces and what that does for us communication wise, um, which makes these spaces so rich for going in and looking with a positioning theory perspective, then also some research considerations and an overview of the research topics and trends that I saw when I was going through um, the research in this area. So to start with affordances, we really need to think about um, how we communicate and how the medium affects positioning. So again, if you're somebody who does your research in other kinds of environments, if you're dealing with people it's you know together in the physical world, um, you need to think then a little bit as you transfer into online environments about what else it is that we can do when we communicate online or how things happen a little bit differently. And so we have our, our older analog ways. Um, you know, I always found it fascinating going back to when I was a student and even as I continued to read and taking classes on things on like ethnomethodology, like the number of studies that were done by people having phone conversations fascinated me because that constrained the, um, the, the, bandwidth of the communication that was happening because we didn't have all of the gestures and facial expressions coming across. Um, we have that information, of course, when we are communicating in person, face-to-face, -face, in the classroom, when we have a lecture, we have that rich information. And, and then what about postal mail? I bring that one up because my husband is a historian. And so he reads people's old letters. And it's kind of fun for me to think about um, you know, people dashing off letters and waiting for a reply. Although he tells me that with some of the people who he studies, they actually had people who were, um, who they paid a small amount to be at the ready while they dashed off the next letter. So that person could go rush it to the next town over so that the correspondence could, um, well, not get anywhere near what we actually consider synchronicity, but um, much faster than perhaps the postal mail works for us today. When we move into these digital environments, so we, um, you know, from mail to email, we've got what can be almost instantaneous and these expectations that somebody could be responding to us very quickly in what is actually a very planned message format. 
Um, we have the ability to just give a simple reaction to somebody, even though we're not there with them. So face to face, we might give a smile and a nod. And now we have digital ways to give the smile and a nod to somebody and not have to use any words. Um, so the affordances of the media really expand the communication options that we have. Um, I like to think of the affordances in a couple of different categories. So one is our temporal affordances. We think about the spontane spontaneity or lack of spontaneity that we have. Um, there's asynchronous, and that's actually um, where the bulk of the research has been done using positioning in online environments. So it's not usually looking at synchronicity and people who are interacting in real time. I think we might start to see a little more of that coming out in particular driven by the pandemic and the increased use of Zoom, but there just wasn't as much of that going on. And then we have pseudo-synchronous interactions, um, like text messages can sometimes give us that sense of synchronicity, but they're not necessarily synchronous. And we can put the message on pause at any time. That's why I put those three bubbles on the screen. You've probably all had that experience where you're texting with somebody and then you're watching the bubbles. You're like, are they replying to me or not? Where is this reply? Right? And we have these dialogues in our head about what the other person might be doing while we are waiting for them to reply, which um, is a fascinating thing to get into, but this is what happens in these environments. We also have the question of how long something lasts. What's the permanence? If you heard the news when Snapchat came out, everybody was concerned because um, the what people shared was not permanent and they worried that you know teens were going to share things that they shouldn't be sharing, thinking that they would disappear. We still worry about these things. Will somebody grab a screenshot? Now we've taken something from not having permanence to a situation where it could have some permanence. Um, with permanence, we also need to think about who has the power to delete something because there are online spaces where we can post something, but we don't have the power to delete it ourselves. We might need, and, and if you get up under the hood of various tools, you can see who has the power and if they have the ability to change that, like the discussion boards in my class, I can make decisions about whether or not my students can delete their own messages or can they delete a whole thread that they started and all of the messages that came after that? Or am I the only person who has that power as the instructor? Um, I mean, that's a pretty cool thing when you think about it. That really switches up um, communication. In, in the physical realm, we can't just wipe away what somebody said a few moments ago before anybody else in the room heard it. Although then it has that ephemerality where it, it's gone into the air and then we accuse people of, you said this. Well, I know I didn't quite say it like that. And we don't have the ability to dial it back and get it precisely. And that that sense of permanence and self-archiving is something that has really driven forward research in online environments, the fact that the data presents itself in that way. Um, spatial affordances, we think about the, the geography, um, some of it's the geography, connecting ourselves across geography. I know we've got an international crowd here today, although there are some some online spaces that are hyper-local. Metadata can give us information about that geography. We can think of the landscape online in terms of um, different platforms, the different tools and the spaces that they give us. We can think of it in terms of the access that people do or don't have, thinking about things like the Great Firewall of China and people who simply cannot access certain tools. Or um, I don't know, we've got the Great Firewall of Florida going on now because we can't access TikTok and um, various Chinese tools at the moment, um, at least in, like not not from our campuses. Uh, we can in the state at large on our on our own devices. Um, we also have to think about who owns space, who's connected in the space, who belongs in the space, and the ultimate reach of the space. And sometimes we have like an intended audience that might be a very few other people, but the space is open and any number of other people can see that space or we're lurking in on another space that that isn't ours. We don't feel like we belong there, but we have a window onto the world. And then there's the multimodal part. And I've just listed out here, like these are all of these rich kinds of data. And if you get into the literature in this area, you find that there are people who are studying emoji and there are people who are studying memes and they are looking at how we communicate 
different things about ourselves and our beliefs, beliefs and our, our power and how we want to align with different um, scenarios in the world. So it's so much more than just text-based. We often, um, unless we're going with video or certain images, we're losing you know, the gestures and the facial expressions, but we still have a lot there. There's a lot of power in a like. I research teenagers who will tell you that if they post an image and it doesn't get enough likes, whatever the likes are, in a certain period of time, they will take it down because they will feel embarrassed otherwise. So there's a power that's there and, and, and there's a responsibility that their friends hold to like what they post after they post it in order to affirm it and keep it there. Um, my little quote on here, dude, why'd you leave me on, on red, which is some, is something that I heard my daughter say to my husband about two or three days ago. And, um, I thought about it in the moment. I was like, who's controlling the communication here? And she had been texting him, um, you know, dad, 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 I would like some Chick-fil-A. And she wanted him to take her out and to go get some fried chicken. This is an, an, not an uncommon occurrence. And she knew that he could see the messages popping up, but he didn't choose to formally read them on the phone. And, and she's like, you know, why are you taking my power away here as a daughter who can, can get you to do whatever I want? Um, and so who controls the communication in these environments is really interesting. There's a big difference between having a post put out by somebody that everybody reacts to versus having a discussion um, or a post and being the reactor to the post or the poster versus the lurker or even profiles versus posts. And there are some people who are using positioning theory to study people's profiles on social media platforms and just how they are um, you know, carefully choosing things to share about themselves and building an identity based on who or what they are aligned with, what that communicates about themselves, and then how they need to change that also as, as the image and the social acceptance of the entities that they've aligned themselves with change, then they need to change their um, alliances with those things. But a lot is communicated about a person and, you know, what they believe and what they believe in, in their profiles and not just in the words that are in their posts. So you get a sense of what, you know, the kind of person you're dealing with. And you've probably, if you are on social media yourself and you've, you know, looked up people you knew in high school and you, you say like, oh, is that what they've become? And you're getting that details, the details from their posts and their profiles together. Um, some of the research considerations we need to make here about privacy and the continuum of privacy. This is a really tough one because um, it, pri first, you know, we tend to think public-private, but it's not an actual dichotomy in practice. Privacy occurs on a continuum. Um, it, I'll use Facebook as an example. Um, you know, We think of Facebook as being public, but actually you do have to sign up for an account. So there's a little bit of a barrier to getting into there. Um, we think of large public Facebook or sorry, large Facebook groups sometimes as being effectively public, especially if it's the kind of group that you just have to click two buttons to join and maybe, you know, affirm that you live in this geographic area, you have an interest in this topic, or you will abide by these rules. And then we think of it as being public after that. But, you know, is it fully public or do the people posting in there have this sense of a smaller audience who they're contributing to? And this is a real tension for, for researchers who want to present their data to the world and don't really have ways of, um, feasible ways of getting consent from participants. And we have to think about whether or not we can freely share what they have, um, what they have written I'm sorry, share what share what the um, data sources, the, the I want to call them participants, but then I don't want to call them participants because they they don't know that they're participants. Can we share that stuff freely in another forum? And that comes up in this work. We need to think about boundaries. We need um, by boundaries, I'm thinking about online spaces versus offline spaces. And the research in this area 
um, can vary widely. You get people talking online about offline phenomenon. You get people talking offline about the online phenomenon. It's it's all over the place. And then there's context collapse, which is um, a concept that's pretty much what it sounds like when you have multiple contexts from your life that come together. Um, sometimes it comes together and it's pleasing and sometimes it comes together and it's not pleasing at all. A lot of people who are in online spaces are communicating with a certain set of people, but other people can see what they are posting. And when those other people show up and comment on it or do something, they feel a little bit violated. Um, you know, we'd say, should they feel violated by this? Maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting phenomenon in itself. You go online, you know, it's a public space. I mean, I'm here today. I'm presenting. This will get posted later. Anybody in the world potentially could see it. How many people do I think will see it? Well, like there are lots of people. I don't think my mom's going to see it. I don't think my neighbor's going to see it, but could they? Maybe. And, and these are all things to consider when doing research in this area. Now, the the trends of research in this area um, have been to either use the archives of online interactions in which all of those considerations I just talked about really come to the forefront. And these are, are some ethical decisions for the researchers to be making. Um, and, and then the researchers get called out themselves. So we've got this other layer of, I mean, I've seen whole conversations in which online where researchers are then positioning themselves about the phenomenon of doing this kind of research and what are their responsibilities to their participants to protect the privacy of their participants. There's also a, um, a fair amount of research that's been done using interviews with people talking about what they do in these online spaces and talking about the interactions that they have. Um, in the research that I went through to write this chapter, I found a range of analytic approaches and, and above all else, when, and, and the, the researchers aren't always doing this, but when they are talking about um, method in depth, and I wish people would talk more about method in depth because we really do need to better understand how people are engaged in this analysis process. When they did, they really illuminated that they were taking a pragmatic approach because they there wasn't a rule book for them to follow and they had to figure out what made sense um, given the phenomenon they were studying, given the medium that it was using, et cetera. So now I'm going to, going to um, bring this all together by talking about some of the research topics that are out there. Um, there were, are, have been people who are just looking in general at online identity and how it gets formed and they've been using a positioning lens in order to look at that. So they're really then they're they're primarily focused on the identity component of what we see coming out of positioning theory. And sometimes they get so far as going into how people are communicating identity in ways that they are also expressing beliefs about um, rights and duties associated with um, well, whatever it is, uh, you, Cynthia, you mentioned the the parenting and the moms, and I've got a little bit of that coming up. And so that that is part of it. Um, so a lot of the research has been with teenagers. And so it's a little bit fuzzier there about what they are, they are um, whether they are trying to communicate anything in, in terms of a moral order there per se, but, but definitely about identity. Um, and look, the research is also trying to tease out what do all these different things we do online with the different affordances of the medium mean? What does it mean when we are sharing and liking and commenting? Um, are we aligning ourselves with the position taken in the post or the meme that we shared? Um, are we aligning ourselves when we like it or when we comment on it? When we use a hashtag in our communication, you know, again, are we we effectively merging ourselves to another group of people who also use that hashtag and, and connecting our identity and our position to whatever direction that group is taking at the moment. Um, in online learning, then it shifts to the rights and duties of instructors and learners. There's been a lot of looking at how um, we get people interacting and working together in online spaces and how that affects learner relationships and class communities. 
Um, the research looks at things like subtle shifts in group work and who's going to take charge in a group of getting things done for an assignment, or if we have to decide on a topic, how are we going to negotiate that and who's going to win, or is it going to truly be a collaborative process? In online parenting, um, that this research body is really fascinating because there's this idea of the good parent and the duties of parents. Um, a lot of, of parents go online, um, especially in the early days of parenting, to make those connections, to feel less alone. But um, as much as they can can share and get information and get people to say what a cute baby you have, they're also suffering from the judgment that happens about what it means to be a good parent. They have to perform being a good parent. Um, they talk about the rights of children, what bad parents do. Um, there's the whole sharenting ph phenomenon where people are um, sharing a lot about their children online and potentially even profiting from it. And whether or not that is an appropriate thing for people to do is something that gets discussed by researchers, but also gets discussed by other parents in the parenting forum. So there's a lot of positioning and a lot of judging that is going on in that realm. Um, in the news media, um, their reactions to news stories, I've popped up here in the top right um, from the, the new TikTok ban bill that's going through um, and the concerns that we have here. And then there are the comments. You'll note that I've blocked out the names of people because even though it actually was in a mostly public space, I mean, it's totally public, but on Facebook, I, I, felt the need to block people's names because they didn't know they would be presented in this forum today. But the people there are positioning themselves against the story. And you wonder like, who, who is their audience? Who are they doing this for? Is the declaration being made just shouting onto social media space to for themselves for the purpose of having said it? Are they hoping other people who know them will read this? They're hoping that they'll, they'll get some unknown audience who will like what they said and that gives them some affirmation that they needed. Um, sometimes people are positioning themselves related to the topic. Sometimes they are repositioning people and themes from the story to get the story right. So the rest of the world understands it the right way. And then finally, we've got research into non-human um, with non-human entities. There's the corporate component of it because there are corporate identities that are um, on social media. In this case, I grabbed an example from Delta. I thought it was funny that, you know, Delta, obviously there's a person, but Delta has asked people, what's the first and last thing you pack before a, a trip? Um, well, Subway responded that you take a foot long. Sub like you can have these whole conversations between corporate entities. And what is that? Why are they doing this? What does this mean? Um, and there are also all of the chat bots and AI agents that are out there now as well. If you ever try to do customer service online, you've interacted with them. I interacted with chat GPT just to get an image here to see what was going to happen um, with it. It wasn't a very satisfying interaction, but just for fun, I asked ChatGPT, I said, so I'm going to give this talk to a group of people about positioning theory in online environments. Could you tell me um, five main points that I should cover in my talk? And this is what ChatGPT gave me. And then the six that said that I should add, I should conclude with a reflection on the future direction of research. So just for amusement, I thought I would share this with you. And then I will take ChatGPT's advice to give you the reflection on the future um, direction of the research. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here still to use positioning theory to really get into nuanced exploration of what's happening in online settings. And there's of the research that I've included in the chapter, there's so much more that's kind of sitting on the margins, but they're not using positioning theory or people who think like they haven't discovered positioning theory yet, but they're thinking in this way. They just don't have the words or the analytic frame for it just yet. Um, I encourage people who are thinking about doing research with some on, into some online settings into thinking about the full breadth of data that's available in the settings and not just restricting themselves to the text because there actually is a lot of richness and a lot of meaning in choices about sharing, choices about images, choices about liking something. And I think there's really an open field here that is waiting for 
many more people to step into it and contribute across so many disciplines. And that's what makes it fascinating. Thank you um, so much for, for that really interesting overview. Um, and at this point, we want to allow for questions about both of these talks uh, for either uh, Cynthia's talk, the first talk that we had relating in positioning theory and Goffman, or the more recent talk that Vanessa did related to online environments. And even as different as these two chapters are, you can see that even um, in her talk, Vanessa started making some connections. So you might have made some connections as well, or you might have a specific question or comment for um, for the author. So you can use your raise hand feature. You can put a question in the chat. We'll try to monitor. I see that um, uh, there is a question from Hanwo Choi. And if you would like to unmute and ask your question, you can, um, or you can put it in the chat. Uh, thank you. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, thanks for the great presentations. Uh, I have a question about, I think uh, positions and footings can be interchangeably used in the Kendall's study that you introduced to us. So I'm, so I'm curious to know your thoughts about that. Mm. Yeah, there's some different, I mean, it's an interesting question. There's some different perspectives here. Um, so there are cases where some scholars use footing and positioning as interchangeable. I think, and I think Kendall acknowledges this too, that what positioning brings is this idea, this, these rights obligations to recognizable sort of social um, statuses, um, ways of, of being, um, whereas footing doesn't necessarily have that. And then there are scholars, I mentioned Branca Ribeiro, who, you know, says, Footing is kind of like, I'm, I'm sorry, positioning is sort of like a bigger thing. So it could be like if a mother is taking up the position of behavior monitor within that, there there could be different footings. Like, for example, um, Ala Tavares and her work talks about how parents sometimes draw like quote material from parenting books, for example, in how they parent. And that would be something where the um, like the author of so getting to Goffman's production format aspect of of um, footing where the the parent is like animating the words of an expert and so it's a more subtle kind of kind of difference so i think you're right i think and it's it's different i mean i think if you go back and if you have the luxury of going back and reading these um these key readings kind of next to each other um there are little differences that you can pick out and some scholars focus on those and use it in productive ways and some scholars say well for my purposes these are similar enough to get it like the um, alignments between people kind of aspect versus the kind of situational definition or storyline I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Other questions or comments? Again, you can raise your hand or feel free to unmute. Um, Bo, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I do. Uh, it's for Cynthia as well. Uh, Cynthia, you didn't speak about <clears throat> the critique. I mean, in the classical text of positioning theory, the first part of it is always, this is not Goffman. This is not about uh, uh, yeah. basis or something like that. Yeah. So I want to ask you what you think about it, because usually <clears throat> sometimes we think about this as merely a straw man, something like that. Oh. It's kind of like it. Yeah. The position uh, on ground and, and, and it's kind of like a dynamic Goffman or something like that. Mm. I was thinking about whether there's something actually deeper within this. Uh, yeah. In this. Um, Played out yeah. between this, this is, these are two very different kind of time periods as well. Yeah, Both, uh, writing in a very conservative mm -hmm. uh, American society, whereas you know, Brunwin and and Ram are writing, uh, the the wall was coming down in in Europe and and stuff like that was going on as well. Mm -hmm. So do you think there's something more? Oh, yeah. I, I, I do. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think anytime you're right, that, that Goffman came first, so like the framing and footing was first and this was supposed to be more dynamic. Um, and then, you know, Davies and Hooray came along and said, well, this is something, but this is not dynamic enough. We're doing something different. We're focusing on identity. So I do think they're, they're different. Um, I, for me, when I look at the flexibility, I mean, what I see now is like both of these theories that can be used in really, really flexible ways to capture like identities as, you know, multifaceted and unfolding moment by moment and to look at situations or storylines as also quite um, 
flexible. So, you know, as a, as a discourse analyst who, um, I really, one of the first things I read when I got in the field was Goffman. I have a sort of special place in my heart um, for Goffman. And so I, I think I, um, for me, I did approach maybe Dave Zinharay slightly more with a critical eye um, and thinking, well, is it different? But I do think it's different. I think um, Sherry Kendall's example is a good one. And we, as we just saw in Vanessa's talk too, that these, there's this aspect of like um, morality and like social obligation that I think Goffman just doesn't, um, doesn't address. And, and I've certainly, especially the way positioning has grown since Davies and Hooray and has been integrated into the study of narrative by Bamberg and, and others, I've found myself turning to positioning for certain types of questions and certain types of, of data. So yeah, so I didn't mean to leave out the critique, except that I, so I have mixed feelings. Like, do I agree with the critique on some levels? Yes. On some levels, I think they could be more similar, but I think each does offer something different. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Maria, I see you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, thanks for both presentations. So I'm, 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 I'm wondering, as I'm hearing Bo and Cynthia talking about, you know, Goffman and uh, Harris kind of um, uh, connections uh, or differences. I wonder um, whether inside the acts, right, the speech acts of the positioning theory and uh, acts and that include actions, obviously, there is this framing and the footing. So whether Goffman's kind of ways in the micro level can help us really think uh, more about acts and actions. Um, and, and then positioning theory in some ways has the storylines and the positions, and they get kind of that the more meso and macro uh, level that gets us from the particular interactions to kind of bigger Mm, orders, uh, moral and and um, larger storyline. So I wonder, uh, Cynthia, how are you thinking about uh, Goffman's micro with yeah. the, the relation to acts, speech acts and speech actions, actions I, inside acts? Yeah, and I do think the way, though, thank you for the question. I do think the way that Goffman's work specifically has been taken up in interactional sociolinguistics, which really does focus on those micro features. So again, this isn't pure Goffman, but it's where Goffman has gone, um, shows that this is a this is a productive approach to looking at the details of social interaction. I think, I mean, for all of us, we have this, these data and we're thinking, what can we use to look at it? And positioning and framing are both available to us. I think if you're a discourse analyst, you have this opportunity to grab onto these different theories. So I think it's a matter of what the focus is, um, I think there's been less, um, there's been fewer studies that have really said, well, positioning does this thing and framing does that thing. And what, what can we draw them, do to draw them together? So I think that that's, for me, that's, that's a really exciting thing. And the way you talk about it is one way that that could be done, I think. Thank you. I, I'm actually curious on that point too, for Vanessa, two, two questions. One is in the studies that you were reviewing related to online and or social media, if people did seem to be pulling Goffman into, into that work at, at all with their examinations of positioning, I know that wasn't what you were looking for. So, um, but that, that question, and then also thinking about the potential for the explorations in those spaces, like where else can they go? I know you touched on that in your future directions, but I'm curious to know a little bit more about that, even in light of the conversations that we that we've been having here about about Goffman, because it seems like in the online and social media space, there's so much more that could be done. It's really um, it's and as you said, people they're working alongside this, but don't necessarily have the language or have adopted these um, frameworks, which can be helpful, I think, from an analytic standpoint as as well as in other ways. So, any thoughts on that? Um, sure. So when going through all of these articles, I, I want to say there were two that, that brought in Goffman at all. And interestingly, if I'm remembering this correctly, um, it's been a little while, but, um, I recall them being kind of like on the edge sort of light on positioning theory it, that they were kind of feeling their way around, not so neither firmly here nor there. So they were citing Goffman. They were citing 
um, a piece or two coming out of positioning theory, and then they were going forward and doing what they were doing. And so some of this comes into when I said that that a lot of the researchers are very much being pragmatists, they there wasn't a clear sense of a of a guide for them of how they would um, use positioning theory to explore a particular phenomenon. Um, there, you can almost feel a tension in some pieces that I read of um, like, I feel like this is a lens that I should use, but I'm not really sure then what the appropriate approach is for analysis at this point. Um, you know, I don't know how I operationalize this. Do I need more of a structure for it? Can I just sort of loosely do it and say like, you know, hey, I think positioning is happening here, but then do I have to call that out in my findings? Um, and, and you know, I, I think that some of that might be the way that people are getting introduced to this conceptually right now um, and just kind of finding it along the way as they're researching whatever phenomenon it is that that um, they're particularly passionate about. Um, even the, I would say research in online spaces in general right now, it, um, it, it's you can see that it's, it's fueled by the passion for the phenomenon that people are studying. Then they're trying to figure out how to use whatever they were taught to do in order to study it. And then you see people starting to expand out from it, you know, like, so you'll, you'll get very, the quantitative content analysis, but, um, you know, then can we, can we get out and really start looking at speech acts and tear them apart and the juxtaposition of what people are saying and the multimodal data, data around it and do that with structure and rigor, but not have to be in the realm of, of quantitative content analysis. And I see that as a tension that a lot of people are trying to, to bridge. I say that also in my role as a journal editor because I see so many manuscripts coming through and I see the peer feedback on them. And one of the things that happens when people are are working with these kinds of data and are um, doing qualitative work, but it doesn't, um, but the the method and findings don't present in highly structured ways that, that the reviewers will often come back and say, you know, how do I know that you did this with rigor? I need more structure coming in play there. That's deviating off your question a little bit, but well, I think no, that's, a that's actually a, it's a good lead into a question that was posted in the, in the chat where, um, Dunha says, I have a question for Vanessa. What suggestions and strategies have you used or would you recommend researchers use in studying social media context to um, this specifically relates to user privacy? Um, for example, how can they examine we examine profiles without exposing identities and also maintaining authenticity? So connected to privacy here, but also what you were just talking about and you know people sort of finding their ways in these um, studies of new environments. Um, I mean, that leads us to have to think really carefully about what we're using as a data source, how we accessed it, um, and then what we're presenting to other people in our final data and trying to connect the dots. So, um, you know, would I feel comfortable unbeknownst to somebody taking a screenshot of their profile and then posting it, you know, putting it into an article, you know, or, or even a tweet, which an X, I don't know, I'll put whatever, which I'm just going with that because it's fully public. Um, I like, I wonder how people feel when they would see their tweets get put on like the nightly news. Like, did you really expect you were going to get that much exposure when you were just mouthing off an opinion for five seconds this morning? Like we, we have this power as researchers to create great discomfort for other people, but we, we also can still present these worlds to, to other people in ways that don't make others vulnerable. So we can start, you know, if you can connect to the person, ask them if it's okay to share it, get permission. Sometimes like the IRB or the ethics board won't require that you do that because it's public and online. Um, but uh, I see a look of surprise there. And no, that's sometimes that's considered okay if it's public and online. I don't, I I hold myself to a standard higher than that. But, you know, I say, remember that they're not the, the final word on these things. We can um, still talk about what we see 
online and maybe we can use words from somebody and check, you know, if you Google them, will that track back to that person? Is it something that we can find? And if they're sufficiently disconnected, then maybe we feel comfortable using that and putting it into our publication. So, you know, it's permission, how how public was something, how easily can it be tracked back to that person? And then I'll also offer up, which um, just as food for thought, several years ago, Annette Markham um, published a, a piece where um, she was talking about data fabrication. And I mean, fabrication is kind of a charged word. And she doesn't mean, you know, just making stuff up for fun, but rather the idea that, that, you know, after, as a researcher, you have been immersed in a particular data set or with a particular population, and they do certain kinds of communication, you probably will find that, you know, you you could give other people an example of, uh, right? For me, I was studying bloggers for a long time, a particular group of bloggers. And I could write, I learned how to write a post in the style of those people. And so I could write a post that would give my reader um, a very vivid sense of the kind of communication that took place there without exposing any of my participants to the vulnerability. I, I think that they, they actually there are some questions that per, that that touch on the things that you've been talking um, talking about. One is about you know using positioning theory to analyze discourse between groups of people and Chat GPT, and does something like that, in your opinion, vi violate um, people's privacy? But also another question about online positioning in social media like TikTok making distinctions between the persona of the content creator influencer, which is part of what you were talking about, right? That that persona that whether it's a blogger or a TikTok or whatever type of um, influencer, and then, you know, thinking about how they can represent a character, right? So there's the in-character part of that. Um, so what are your thoughts on on those types of situations? Um, I mean, if somebody is putting themselves out there trying to be an influencer and and get a broader audience, it starts to shift things. But there's still a lot of conversation about what makes a public figure a public figure and at what point do they become their right? Like we consider politicians fair game for going at this. But but, um, you know, do we take the influencers out of the context of the group of people who they're trying to influence? I, don't, I mean, that's a just a big ethical question for us to to ask, although I would say that the influencers are people you could readily reach and get a response from and say like, hi, I'm doing this, this research, would you be comfortable with me doing this? And then of course, it's a matter of what we say because people don't want to see them themselves portrayed in an unflattering manner in somebody else's research. The, the, which is a good a good point, right? That's a longstanding problem in the research field of people sort of taking up research and then uh, people being surprised by how they're <laughs> por portrayed in various contexts. Um, other a final a one, we probably have time for one question or comment. If, if we're about out of time, any anything I've missed or. Um, I have a question if nobody else wants to. Um, I was thinking about Vanessa that um, in a certain sense, I think we are positioned by the platforms we're actually in. I mean, Jose Fantique has uh, tried to describe this in a very good way in the platform society and stuff like that. But since these platforms use algorithms, which we don't know, how can we analyze how they position us? Um, does this doesn't this kind of like open up positioning theory to use new methods like reverse engineering uh, and stuff like that? How do we engage with the that this thing that we actually be positioned in a certain sense? So there's in the old in the positioning theory, with, there's always a third order positioning going on when we are on the, in online positioning environments. I think or something. And the role of the algorithm is is fascinating. I'll admit I haven't thought about. The role of the algorithm in terms of positioning theory before, but um, you know it's definitely um, an entity that needs to be considered and all that. I I will tell you with the the teens I researched, they're very deliberate about 
many of them are very deliberate about building their algorithms. I've been talking to them lately about news stories that they will follow or social issues that they're encountering online. And they, they often have tension there with things like the what they see their friends posting and they feel like a, res a responsibility to like what their friend posted because their friend posted it, but they don't necessarily, it's not even that they disagree with the social issue. They don't feel as political. They don't want to see more of that. And so they're worried if they like it, that now their algorithm is going to be filled with it. And so they're, they're stuck between how do I support my friend and how do I keep my algorithm the way I want it? Yeah, I think that's in yeah, I think that comes up in Denmark as well. A lot of our students try to hack completely always hack the the live feed and and that in terms of that as well. So but I was thinking on a, on a more deeper level, I mean the different platforms use different kind of algorithms. And they obviously they want to position us in different way because we are the products, not the consumers in right. Certain, right? So that, that means that there's some sort of kind of positioning game is going on. Uh, which we don't know anything about. So, but it would be very interesting actually to look into how we can actually observe that or, or kind of like analyze that. Um, does it? Do you know anybody has done anything about so that? No, but I haven't gone very deep into algorithmic research, and I'm I'm wondering the degree to which I and mean, it feels like some of this because it's 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 so big that to understand it you'd really have to get into the code, so to speak. And I wonder if people would, uh, if researchers would even be allowed access mm. to that kind of information from the different platform companies. Yeah, I think that some of the, some of the algorithms are proprietary and heavily, heavily guarded. Others people have been able to, to somewhat identify. I think those are really big issues, really interesting too, in terms of like all of the framing and thinking about this from Goffman's perspectives too, and the synergy that can be there in these um, in these analytic frameworks. Um, I think we need to leave things here because we want to respect the time of our uh, of our presenters. And uh, we have obviously many additional topics and questions that we can continue to surface. So thank you so much to Cynthia and Vanessa today for uh, sharing your uh, chapters with us. And please do register for future events. And um, if you can get to Finland this summer, we'll see you in Finland as well. Thank you everybody so much for your attendance and being part of our community here today.